Hello and welcome to The Bitcoin Show. We have uh, a great show for you today. And uh, we have a fantastic guest and lots of really cool stuff to talk about today. Um, however, literally, like about three minutes before uh, I came into this room, I got a pop message right up on my screen um, <clears throat> directly from Mark from Mount Gox, um, breaking news uh, press release that he just sent to me. And um, so I had to read it very hastily. And um, <clears throat> it's basically a lot of the same information um, that we already know, but there is a little bit of new information that might be interesting to you. So um, I just want to run through this real quick because it is sort of breaking news. Uh, a press release directly from Mt. Gox about the Mt. Gox hack incident. Um, so I'm just going to read it very quickly just to, so that you get the gist of it because I think it's really, really important to the Bitcoin community um, being the online exchange that has always had, well, at least recently, has had 90% market share. Really important to us, right? So he's got in this press release a, um, basically, uh, it's sort of a chronology of, what, of events of what has taken place. And um, I'm going to read it to you, um, especially the, the most important points of it. Um, first, of course, I want to thank we wouldn't be here without our beloved sponsors. Please thank them um, for us. Carpe VM, C A R P E V M, carpevm.com, video marketing, seize your market, say it with video. Thank Charlie for supporting us. And Mezzi Grill, M E Z E, grill.com, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. And they're the first restaurant in the world to accept Bitcoin. And tradehill.com, of course. The place to buy and sell bitcoins with ease online without leaving your home. Tradehill.com, 10% off your trades for life with the referral code for the Bitcoin show, TH-R141 on your screen now. And USGoldCoins.com, our trusted advisor for excellent investments in numismatic, which just means rare and precious, US gold and silver coins, USGoldCoins.com. We thank our sponsors. So... Here's the press release that I just received from uh, Mark directly just moments ago. And uh, really quickly, while I was getting uh, my jacket on, I read through it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you. It's sort of a chronology. So it begins here, March, 20, or March 2011. Uh, Mount Gox, now the world's leading Bitcoin exchange, was purchased by Tibain or Tibain Company Limited. As part of the purchase agreement for a period of time, Tibain Company Limited was required to pay the previous owner a percentage of commissions. In order to audit and verify this percentage, see there's new information here, that's why I wanted to read this to you. Um, as, as you can see, there's a, he's, he's filled in a lot more information. As part of this purchase arrangement, um, the um, Tibain Company Limited, the new current owner, uh, was required to pay the previous owner, which I'm assuming is Jed, of course, um, a percentage of commissions. So it was part of the arrangement. This, uh, um, so in order to audit and verify this percentage, that's why the financial audit, right? In order to audit and verify this percentage, the previous owner retained an admin level user account. This account was compromised. So, so far we've not been able to determine how this account's credentials were obtained. So they don't know for sure, apparently. I, I'm obviously adding my own thoughts. Um, section two is Bitcoin sell-off. So on June 20th, at approximately 3 a.m. Japan time, uh, an unknown person logged into the compromised admin account and with the permission of that account was able to arbitrarily assign himself a large number of Bitcoins, which he subsequently sold on the exchange, driving the price from 17.50 to one cent within the span of 30 minutes. With the price low, the thief was able to make a large withdrawal, approximately 2,000 Bitcoin, before our security measures stopped further action. We would like to note that the Bitcoins sold were not taken from others' users' accounts. They were simply numbers with no wallet backing. For a brief period, the number of Bitcoins in the Mt. Gox exchange vastly outnumbered the Bitcoins in our wallet. Normally, this should be impossible. Unfortunately, the 2,000 Bitcoin withdrawal did not... I'm sorry, with, uh, unfortunately, the 2,000 Bitcoin withdrawal did have real wallet backing, and they, were, and they will be replaced at Mt. Gox's expense. Again, apart from the compromised admin account, no individual user's account was manipulated in any way. 
That's good news. All Bitcoin and cash balances remain in intact. That's fantastic news. Given the relatively small amount of damage, considering what was potentially possible, we have to question what the true motives of the attacker were. Perhaps the attack simply was not well orchestrated, but the possibility exists that the attacker was more interested in making a statement, hurting Mt. Gox's reputation, or hurting the public image of Bitcoin in general, than he was in monetary gain. Section three, database breach. Late last week, we discovered a SQL, SQL, SQL injection vulnerability in the Mt. Gox.com code, which we suspect is responsible for allowing an attacker to gain read-only access to the Mt. Gox user database. The information retrieved from that database included plain text, email addresses, and usernames, unsalted MD5 passwords on accounts that had not logged in since prior to the Mt. Gox ownership transfer, and salted MD5 passwords on those accounts created or logged in to post-ownership transfer. We speculate that the credentials of the compromised admin account responsible for the market crash were obtained from this database. The password would have been hashed, but it may not have been strong enough to prevent cracking. Regrettably, we can confirm that our list of emails, usernames, and hashed passwords has been released on the internet, which we all know by now. Our users and public should know that these hashed passwords can be cracked, and many of our users' more simple passwords have been cracked. This event highlights the importance of having strong passwords, as I've been saying, by the way, in the show, have a strong password, which means 16 characters or more, numbers, letters, and symbols, and totally unique that you don't use on any other site. Use a software like KeyPassX to manage them, so that, because of course you can't remember a strong password, but it's very important because we're talking about money. My commentary is inserted here. Our, um, our users and public should know that these hashed passwords can be cracked and many of the more simple passwords have been cracked. This event highlights the importance of having strong passwords, which will now be enforcing. They will now be enforcing, they say. We strongly encourage all of our users to immediately change the passwords of any other accounts that now or previously shared a password with their Mt. Gox account if they have not done so already, which I've been you know, advising that everyone do already. Section four, present steps. We've been working tires, tirelessly with other service providers in order to mitigate the potential damage to our users caused by the security breach. We've been informing our users to be especially cautious of Bitcoin-related phishing attempts at the email addresses associated with their Mt. Gox accounts. And by the way, if you don't know what phishing is, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, for those of you who don't know what that means, you're not familiar with that term, it means uh, sending you an email pretending to be someone else to try and trick you into getting information about you. So like an email that looks like it's from Mt. Gox, but it's not really from Mt. Gox, and they're trying to get you to click a link in the email and go somewhere and type in your login ID and password. It's just a, a trick website that looks just like the, the real one. Uh, don't ever fall for any, any email like that. If you're not sure, cl close the email, open a new browser, and type in the web address of the site you're talking about and log in with a fresh new window. Don't ever click a link in an email to get to, um, to a login screen. Okay. Um, Users should continue to be especially observant of indicators of account compromise with other services, especially email and financial services. You know, we've already heard from the sort of a press release from mybitcoin.com that about 1% of their users lost their, their Bitcoin because of that exact same thing. They use the same login ID, same email address, same password on both services. Very bad idea. Okay, back to the statement. We would like to give a special thanks to the Google team who are extremely proactive about flagging and temporarily locking customer accounts that appeared in our stolen list. Their quick response, no doubt, significantly reduced unauthorized account access to Gmail addresses associated with Mt. Cox accounts. That's when you logged into your Gmail account and it said, hey, your account could have uh, suspicious activity and it forced you to pick a new password. A lot of people got that, including me. We've been actively researching the origin of the attack that led to the compromise of Mt. Gox's previous owner's admin account. However, our priority has been getting the Mt. Gox service back online and getting people access to their funds. We were finally able to simultaneously relaunch the service and launch our new site, 
with greatly improved security on the back end on June 26, 2011. Okay, section five, future steps. The new Mt. Gox site features SHA-512 multi-iteration, triple salted hashing, and soon we'll have an option for users to enable a withdrawal password that will be separate from their login password. Other security measures such as one-time password keys are planned for release very soon as well. The recent successful attacks on huge institutions like Sony and Citibank remind us that nobody is impenetrable. We're now operating under the presumption that another security breach will happen at some point in the future. And we are implementing layers of fail-safe mechanisms to greatly limit the amount of damage possible. Of course, we're doing our best to make sure those fail-safe mechanisms are never necessary. While we are making great strides with the advancement of security, we should remind our users that they too play an important role in securing their accounts. Please use long password and standard, uh, the standard is not whether a person should, could guess it, but rather whether a computer could guess it. This is what I've been saying all week, right? And computers can guess very fast. Please do not share passwords across services. In other words, don't use the same password on two different services of any kind ever. Where passwords are shared, a compromise at one service means a compromise at all services. Help us help you. This is something, by the way, that I, I always talk about because literally, um, you know, Gawker, ha uh, one of the blog sites had a, a hack, a leak, whatever. They published the, the login IDs and the passwords of every single person on there. And I was one of those people, just lazy, oh, so lazy. I don't want to remember a password, a different password on every site. If you don't have a password manager, it, it becomes very, very painful to try and, what, you're going to write them all down, carry them in your wallet? It's silly. So uh, my password was leaked among millions of other people's. And um, so that was the password that I used everywhere. Luckily, I mean, it was only on things I didn't care much about, like blogs. But once your, pa once your login ID and or email address and your password is out there, published on the internet, man, you're in trouble. Because you will not remember the hundreds and hundreds of places you logged into. And it could be very embarrassing if somebody hacks into your account or worse, if it's money involved. And Bitcoin is money, remember, Bitcoin's money. Okay. Back to this. Section six, apology. The truth is that Mt. Gox was unprepared for Bitcoin's explosive growth. Our dated system was built as a hobby when Bitcoins were worth pennies apiece. It was not built to be a Fort Knox capable of securely handling millions of dollars in transactions each day. This is very candid and honest, isn't it? We can attempt to blame the owner of the compromised account for the recent events, but at the end of the day, the responsibility to secure the site and protect our users rests with us the admin account responsible had more permissions than necessary, and our security triggers were not as tight as they could have been. Since the change of ownership, we have actively been patching holes while at the same time building a new Bitcoin exchange from the ground up. Going forward, we're certain that the launch of the new site will exceed the rightful expectations our users have of the service. We only hope that we can once again earn the trust of the Bitcoin community in the meantime, we sincerely appreciate the patience all of our users have shown. We've got a backlog of emails we're catching up on now, but if you have any questions or comments about the recent security breaches and events, Mt. Gox in general, its founder, or Bitcoin, please do not hesitate to contact us. We are reading every message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Mark Carpales, CEO, Taibane Company Limited, uh, which is mtgox.com. So there you have it. That's uh, hot off the press. And um, you know, if we look at the um, new revelations, if, when I interviewed Mark and Adam on the show, I, I, you might recall I asked them, I said, there are rumors that, or speculation that uh, the account, that the, the huge account that got hacked was your account. Is that true? And they just said, well, uh, 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 <laughs> it's really under investigation and we can't comment. So obviously now they're saying that it really sort of was, I mean, it wasn't theirs, but it was an admin account that was uh, controlled by the previous owner, which is Jed. And also um, the, uh, what else was the, the other big revelation that um, the database breach and the uh, um, presence, you know, obviously the whole new system with all this new uh, uh, technology to uh, help encrypt the, um, the, the new passwords. What was the other thing that was um, revealed? Mm, missed it. Anyway, um, I read the whole thing, so you've got it. You got the picture. 
So, um, what do you think? What do you think, chat room, about all this? The, um, <laughs> do you feel like uh, uh, Mount Gox has uh, been very upfront and, and honest and uh, they're doing a really good job of handling this? Do you feel like um, they are trustworthy? Have they earned your trust? Have they lost your trust? Are you going to trust them again? What do you guys think? All right, so we'll come back to that. Um, and uh, let's get back to the, to the uh, main topic at hand. And uh, that is our guest who's visiting us uh, live from Australia. And um, so welcome. Welcome to the show, Jeremy West. And you're, um, Jeremy, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. So what do you think about it? By the way, what do you think of this since this has kind of been interjected at the beginning of, of today's show? Yeah, well, uh, I watched the interview that you did with Mark and Adam mm -hmm. and that, that interview actually started to renew my confidence. The fact that they were showing their faces and they were explaining what was happening and mm -hmm. um, I was, yeah, I was really glad that they showed their faces because obviously there was rampant speculation and um, obviously, showing their faces made it clear that they weren't just going to disappear into the ether or whatever. So, and then, yeah, I'm glad they're continuing to be uh, transparent with what's happening. And also, they have um, they've apologized and taken responsibility for what happened. And, and that all makes me feel a lot better about everything that's happened with Matt Gox. Right. Uh, and the, the fact that they're explaining it, even though, I mean, they couldn't... Uh reveal everything probably at the time I'm sure um, you know is still under investigation they don't they still don't know it sounds like that was another thing that they um, that they did admit here was that um, so far we've not been able to determine how this accounts credentials were obtained they they still really don't know and so they're being very candid about that yeah so they're they're being very candid about everything and transparent and um, it, yeah restored uh, their, my confidence in them is restored to a, to a high level, at least in mm -hmm. um, what they're trying to do and uh, what, what I learned from the whole situation. My, my spendbitcoins.com, which we're going to talk about, was actually set up to, for payments to all go through Mt. Gox. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was closed for the week that they were closed. Oh, right. And and basically, I, I learned that I needed to not be reliant on one exchange. So now my payments are coming directly to me. I think that time. that's, yeah, that's something that we've all learned is that, um, you know, as, as decentralized as Bitcoin is and all the benefits that Bitcoin has, we, we really shouldn't defeat the benefits by dealing with only one exchange. We have to have, I mean, we can have only one TV, but we can't have only one exchange. That we have to really have multiple exchanges, and I think everybody agrees about that, including Mt. Gox and Trade Hill and all the others, that we have to have multiple exchanges. The more distributed, the better. The more anonymous, the better. All of these things. We, and even, even the virtual sense of Bitcoin that, um, you know, you want to retain all the benefits that Bitcoin has. And as soon as we do something that, you know, forfeits the benefits, then um, it's really not good. Yeah, well, that one thing that you've revealed there, where they said that the bitcoins that that were used, the five hundred thousand, or mm -hmm. is that how many was? Uh, anyway, the, the yep. bitcoins that were used to sell the price down to one cent were not actual bitcoins in existence, or something that they were saying, which makes a lot more sense because I wasn't understanding why someone who is enthusiastic enough to have that many bitcoins right. had them all on the exchange rather than encrypted on their computer and um, that didn't make any sense to me. So That's that right. That's, that's the other thing. I, you're right. I, I missed that because I, I knew there was something else that was revealed and that's exactly right. That the Bitcoins were not actual Bitcoins from any particular... This is one thing that never made sense to me is like, well, why aren't people screaming like, my Bitcoins are gone, my Bitcoins are gone because if... Um, in this case, he's saying that they really weren't, they didn't exist in the first place. It was an admin access account that had more privileges than it should have, and they could, they just were artificial bitcoins. They were just numbers in the system, and they could they were just arbitrary numbers. They could say 10 million bitcoin or whatever they wanted, and just sell them all. So basically, they just completely hacked the system. Yeah. Mm hmm. So that makes a lot more sense, and and it's also very. Uh, <laughs> 
I mean, in spite of how horrible this is, uh, and the data breach, I mean, even, forget the passwords, that's, that's another thing, but even just the list of the users and their email addresses, that's, you know, that's the privacy and, and, and anonymity people trust in an exchange. I mean, obviously their money is the most, thing, the most important thing, their passwords are probably the second most important thing because people do use them on multiple uh, sites, the same password, which they shouldn't, but they do. But um, even the simple thing that's kind of not been brought up that much is the names of the users. I mean, people use their real names. They use their real email yeah. addresses, even their business email addresses where they work. And so there's a lot of um, confidentiality that was exposed, which is also very bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does, it felt personal to, to have your email address up on that um, seat that file that had all the email addresses and, and hash passwords. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, it's not like... I just, I just uh, introduced my mother-in-law to Bitcoins, and, she, and I, I just sold her some that were put up on that Gox. So, uh, and now she's on the list. Yeah, and she was staying with us because we just had a newborn. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit embarrassing to get up the next morning or a couple mornings later and say, oh, your password, you need to go change your password everywhere. And you have to exp <laughs> and also explain to her why she's getting all these weird spam things and don't click them and all that. Yeah, it's been, a, yeah. It's been more than an inconvenience to people. Um, but at the same time, okay, having said all that, how terrible it is, it's very comforting to know that nobody actually lost any dollars or Bitcoin. That's really important and, and a very good thing. Other than Mt. Gox losing 2,000 Bitcoins worth. Right, themselves, right. Which, um, you know, is you know, kind of, I guess, the cost of doing business in this type of a yeah. business. So the future steps, and uh, I think, are, sound very, very good and sound. And the apology, obviously, that's important. And I'm uh, really glad to, to see that. Um, so I guess the, the community will decide um, the fate of, the, of uh, Mt. Gox and whether they're well, going I've, to I've rebuild looking, their... I've been watching BitcoinCharts.com, and mm -hmm. I've actually been surprised. It looks like it's... It looks like uh, once Mt. Gox reopened, they're still getting the vast majority of the trades over mm -hmm. Trade Hill. Yeah. Is it because the people already have their accounts there and they already have their money there? But, um, yeah, it, was, it, it seems like a lot of people's trust, I guess, has been restored because I expected things to everybody to move to, uh, to other exchanges, I guess, and mm -hmm. it hasn't happened that way. Not immediately, yeah. anyway. Yeah, I wonder, it might just be that people are comfortable with, you know, believe it or not, I mean, I believe that um, there's just sort of a sort of comfort to a certain website that you know how it works and you're used to the layout and the colors and the buttons and you know how, you know, it's just you already have an account there and it's all there. there it's always easier to stick with the software you're used to than to learn something new. So um, I wonder how much of it is that, but... Um, there's also, I mean, um, you, would, you would expect that after this, that... They might be the most secure. Yeah, site. that's exactly <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I remember that you know, like Ed and I had a trip planned to Europe um, right at the time of 9/11, and we were literally um, on 9/11. I was packing to go to Europe, and um, I and Ed ran out to the store for something, and and I'm like packing, and the CNN is on, and I'm like, what is that? A trailer for a movie? And I saw the whole thing happen. Anyway. The, the bottom line was obviously, you know, you know the rest of the story, but the airports were closed for a couple of weeks. But they actually scheduled our trip for the very next day, the first day the airports opened. And, and I really wasn't, people said, aren't you afraid to fly? And I'm like, no, you know, I really think that that day will probably be the safest day in aviation history to fly because everyone will be at the utmost, you know, a high alert, you know, um, status. So um, yeah. it's kind of like that, yeah. The day after Mount Gox opens up, I think that uh, it's probably maybe the most secure day it ever had. So, yeah, all right. But anyway, I'm doing trading on both Trade Hill and, and Mount Gox now. Yeah, both now, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, I think overall, you know, the, it, it all depends on how you look at things, if it's half, a glass half full or half empty, but I think that Overall, it's actually good for the Bitcoin community because, and the whole Bitcoin economy because people are realizing and being reminded of the importance of secure passwords, the importance of decentralization, not just one exchange. Um, obviously, you know, it's helping, 
you know, in a sad way for a you know, sad reason, it's helping Trade Hill get established and all that, which is, you know, overall for the whole community, it's probably a good thing for everybody. Um, and not only I'm, that, the fact that there was no, there was no collapse after the price reopened. The price didn't collapse. It was Reopen absolutely it. fictitious. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it wasn't a real. It wasn't a real disaster. I mean, nobody lost any money or Bitcoin except Mt. Gox, and uh, you know, which I guess deservedly so, so. You know, they they weren't prepared. Whatever. That's the business. And the and there was no real price collapse. I mean, it, people talk about it. Oh, it proves that Bitcoin's not safe and all that. It's nonsense. Uh, obviously, it proves that Bitcoin is safe and secure. And um, surprising, actually, how uh, you know, durable the whole system is. But the fact that there's now two strong exchanges, and there probably will be more, um, it's, and, and everybody is on high alert. I'm sure Trade Hill learned a lot from watching yeah. this. They're like, make sure we don't make those mistakes. I'm sure every exchange Absolutely. site is learning from this, right? We're all learning lessons. Yeah. So. Absolutely. It, it's a it's a good thing in the end if if you look at it as a good thing it's a good thing. So let's talk about what we originally planned to talk about because the reason Jeremy is here is because you created a site called Spend Bitcoins. Is that right? Spendbitcoins.com. That's right. Spendbitcoins.com. So tell us what is Spendbitcoins.com. Basically, when I started into bitcoins, um, there wasn't really a way to spend them other than, you know, there were different sites that would, um, web developers that would take Bitcoins and individual to individual, um, that sort of thing. But there wasn't, there weren't a lot of merchants that were accepting Bitcoins. And there were, there, I saw a few different places where you could buy Amazon or Newegg gift cards for Bitcoins, but the transaction fees for doing so were anywhere from maybe three to seven percent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, getting your money, I guess spending the Bitcoins was expensive. So the whole idea of Bitcoins is that there are no transaction fees with Bitcoins, and it's not like credit cards and that sort of thing, so there's no transaction fees either for merchants or for the consumer. So I thought there needed to be a way to spend Bitcoins with major online merchants without having any exchange fees. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started up. started with Amazon. And from customer demand, added new egg, and there's a website in, in Australia called Fish Pond. It's like Amazon, and I'm about to add Barnes and Noble. And over time, what the actual plan is not to be using sites like Amazon and New Egg. I'll leave those there as affiliates, but I am working on getting my own wholesalers so that SpendBitcoins.com will be the, the the online place to buy anything you want with bitcoins, basically. So you're going to start your own Amazon, your own Newegg. That's right. So if, you'll be—I you know, mean, you'll have all like every kind of product, just like they do. That's the plan. And wow. For the for the time being, I do because I'm using them. But over time, I'll be adding slowly adding my own products to the point that people. Because right now it's a little bit convoluted. You have to come on. Uh, Go do your shopping on Amazon through my affiliate link. Mm -hmm. uh, find out what your total is. Come back to my site. Put in your total in U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars or euros or wherever you are, and uh, have it then come back to you with the number of bitcoins and, and so on and so forth. So the mm -hmm. idea in the end will be you just come to my site. The prices are all displayed in bitcoins, and you just use the shopping cart and check out in bitcoins. Why is that? I, I noticed that because I was checking it out earlier. Why is it that I have to, why is it like a three, three step thing? Can't I just go to Newegg or something, find the URL for the product I want, and then come back to your site and just paste it in? Why do I have to use the affiliate link and come back and then go back again? Yeah, well basically, that's the only way that I can make it a free service and yet be able to make money out of it myself, mm -hmm. is for people to do their shopping through, through my affiliate links. Mm. And um, for me to get credit for it, they have to okay. actually add it to their shopping cart. So by using link. your affiliate link, they're supporting you by you know so that you get the affiliate uh, fee. They're supporting the site to make you know to to thank you. And then by then they enter their email address and whether they're is it only USA and Canada by the way? Uh, on Newegg is only USA and Canada uh, the Newegg sites. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon is U.S., Canada, Japan, England, 
Germany, um, Italy, oh, and France. I see. Right. Okay. And then you, and then you put in the exact total. And how you heard of us? What is that? Where does that information go? The email address, the site, and the total. What is that doing actually? How does that work? Um, so that just comes to me in the form of an email to let me know once the bitcoins arrive, mm -hmm. who I'm sending the gift card to. Oh, okay. So is this a manual process then? You right now at this point? The only bit that's manual is me ordering the gift code on. Amazon or Newegg, mm -hmm. um, they're automatically, immediately upon clicking submit, you'll get an email that gives you the amount as well as the Bitcoin address to send the Bitcoins to. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then it takes up to 12 hours to receive the actual gift code from Amazon or Newegg. And then you go back to, it says here, then you go back to Amazon and complete the purchase with the gift card. Oh, okay, so then... It'll give me, so basically get, I'll get an email with a Bitcoin address and the amount to send and I send the amount of Bitcoins to that address and then I'll get another email back and then I go to that site and complete the purchase using the gift card. You'll send me a gift card number in the email, the next email. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. So it's a couple steps, but at least you can, you can actually make a purchase using Bitcoin. I think, I think it sounds a bit more complicated than if you actually go to the site yeah. and spend Bitcoin. Um, uh, it's just... It's just four important. steps. I'm sure once you do it once, it's like, it's not a big deal. Yeah. So now, you so you make money for the referral link, of course, because, you know, you're referring business to the site. And then, yep. are, are you, do, is there your business model, then you also, do you make a little bit on the, uh, on the rate, the exchange rate? No. That, no? That's... The whole, I mean, I can if I hold on to them and, and they've gone up, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea is that everywhere else I saw that you could spend Bitcoins, you know, on Amazon or Newegg or whatever, was charging, their their exchange rate was... Uh, they had a little rake in there, percent? In just dollars, then it would actually be on, say, the if Mount Gox or Trade Hill. Okay. My exchange rate is just based on the 24-hour average um, from BitcoinCharts.com. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. So, okay, so you're taking the 24, oh, it says right there, doesn't it? In the, in the asterisk, you're taking the 24-hour average of BitcoinCharts.com weighted average of the exchange rate for all the exchanges. Oh, that's interesting. That's right. It used to be the 24-hour average on Mt. Gox, but I've learned that not to rely on one exchange. So. Yeah, the, you, everybody's learned a lesson, and especially Mt. Gox. So, <laughs> all right. So actually, that's kind of a good thing. Another little uh, use for spendbitcoins.com. If you want a, a more of an averaged out um, simple value for Bitcoin, you can go to spendbitcoins.com and just look at the rate because that's going to yeah. give you the average 24-hour. You know, I like that because obviously, you know, the rate goes up and down and up and down every, every 10 minutes and people have the widget on their phone and they're like, oh, it's up, oh, it's down, it's up, down, up, down. It's like like the elevator, you know, it's crazy. So this gives you more of a standard, um, you know, 24 hour average rate, which is probably a lot more consistent of a weighted average. Now, how do you weight the average from the different exchanges based on the, the, the volume? To be honest, that, that um, comes, that, that's given to me straight from bitcoincharts.com, so. Okay, uh, straight from Bitcoin <laughs> charts. That's theirs. I don't know the okay. technicalities behind how they weight it. Okay, that's cool. A little widget. So, uh, but that's the rate, and at the time you purchase it, that's what you give them, and you you're basically just t converting those to uh, to dollars to buy the gift cards on Amazon, Newegg, Fishpond, and so on, right? Yeah. And so okay. I'm not taking any I'm not taking any commission from the consumer. The commission's coming from Amazon or Newegg or whoever. So. So basically, you're not getting any money out of this except for the referral link. That's why it's yeah, so important right. that they use your referral link because otherwise you don't make anything. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I, so have, I do know that there are people who, you know, obviously, um, anyway, I, I've had people tell me that, you know, I don't have enough Bitcoins, but, or I don't have Bitcoins at all right now or whatever, but I'm supporting your site by going through the links anyway. Oh, so that's nice. Something to be done. Yeah, so <laughs> even if you're not going to shop, uh, even if you don't have the need to shop, 
on um, you know on, uh, for you know spend bitcoins you can actually go if you're ever gonna buy anything on Amazon fish pond new egg or these you can just go there and click his referral link and shop anyway with your regular credit yeah. card or PayPal if you want to support what um, Jeremy's doing here with spendbitcoins.com I think it's a great idea it's fantastic not only a great idea but a great implementation of it and you said you're gonna which one is it you're gonna add new uh, real soon Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. Okay, cool. So, are, are there plans to add um, others? Yeah, um, I, I I need to put up on the site. Now I'm announcing it, so I'll need to put it up today, I guess. Um, <laughs> a way for people to suggest a store uh, that they want to see up next. Oh, you're going to ask people what which ones they would like up next, huh? Just to, yeah, to because I you know. Okay. Um, to help me know. What people are really looking for. Sure. So. Ed, uh, well, I'll ask Dr. Frugal. What, what what websites do you shop at most when you shop online? What are the what are the main, uh, major? Buy.com. Buy.com. You hear that? Uh, what? Yeah, new egg. My low, low price. Mm. What's it called? My low price. My low. Mo mono. Mono. Oh, mono. M O N O price dot com. Mono and what did okay. you say? Buy.com. And what else? Uh, Those are the main ones. <laughs> okay. He goes to dealsofamerica.com and Deals Plus, which is dealspl.us. But those are not actual retailers. Those are like, you know, uh, aggregators of deals. I'm giving all the, all the way all the frugal secrets away. Yeah, there's a, we have a, a show that's launching called uh, the Frugal Show, is which is all about online shopping, saving money shopping online, and uh, and otherwise. So I'm um, giving away all the secrets. But anyway, yeah. So those are the uh, yeah. As long as you cover the major online retailers, that's brilliant. Um, it's, I hope that it gets easier so that, you know, these, these online retailers could make it a little bit easier so that you could actually do it with one step, like use the referral link and get the, um, uh, I guess you'd have to, well, you'd have to, you have to add it to the cart to find the price with these things, right? Yeah, so that's it. It's tricky to find the exact price unless they buy a gift card that's, what if they buy a gift card that's more than the... Uh, more or less. So if they put in the wrong amount, what happens then? That's fine. It'll I mean, what do you mean? Well, like, like it, I guess if they, if they use the referral link and they put in this information, they put in the amount, they're buying something for $50, but they actually put in 100 then what, they're going to end up... They'll be left with the, the, ex, the extra 50 on their Amazon account. On their, on their gift card for their Amazon card, which they can just keep reusing that number to shop with it, right? And what yeah, if they right. don't put enough on? What if there's, uh, they don't, they, the amount they put in is not sufficient? Well, I had that yesterday where somebody got to the, the, the shipping wasn't added before they mm. put in the total or something. So they just uh, came back and added three, uh, made another order for $3, basically. Oh, okay. And so you, you can use multiple gift cards on one order, mm. or you can be left with change. And the, the gift cards never expire either. Mm -hmm. uh, on either of those two. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Amazon you could do something like this with like that green dot money pack. Um, I don't even know how that works exactly, but I know that that green dot money pack, you can actually, uh, if you can get a virtual card this way, you can actually um, spend it many, many, many ways, like um, cell phone bills and prepaid things and eBay. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways. I don't know if, it's a, if there's a way to tie it in with that, but you know, the more options, the better, I would think, right? Yeah. Cool, cool. So um, that's really very, very interesting. And I'm, I'm surprised that you don't um, take a cut on the, um, on the actual rate. You know, I... Well, that's the whole idea. Other people were already out there doing, you know, there's bitcoinbuy.info. Mm -hmm. um, I think he started just after me, but um, I know, I, I can't remember the other web website addresses, but... There's other people that were selling Amazon and New Egg gift mm -hmm. cards, mm -hmm. but um, their exchange rate obviously wasn't, it was in their favor, mm -hmm. um, which there's nothing wrong with that, but the whole idea, the point of difference with mine is that you're going to actually get what your Bitcoins are worth. You know, I, if, I, if, you, if I can give you a suggestion, I think that it would be, uh, you, you should put that right there in the headline. Instead of spend your Bitcoins, 
it should uh, you should put right there in the headline um, you know nothing added to the rate this is the well you've got current rate but somehow how could you say that saying this is you know no no fees added to the rate this is the exact rate I know it's sort of in the fine print but somehow to really yeah. re-emphasize that because at first glance I'm just going to assume that oh you're probably taking you know a quarter of a percent or something like that. Yeah, you're right. But that's the, that's the key feature of it. That should be the headline, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. My marketing suggestion. But um, I think it's a great thing that you're doing for the whole Bitcoin community because you know these retailers are going to accept Bitcoin whether they like it or not, <laughs> right? That's it. <laughs> and you don't even have to. I mean, with this, you just you can have Bitcoin anywhere in any any kind of Bitcoin wallet and just uh, shop online with it. That's brilliant. Also, I've I've seen people actually pay. Uh, you know, use uh, or sell prepaid Visa Mastercards with it. You know, they're like a virtual Visa Mastercard number. Have you thought about that? Adding that to your I system? I have. That, yeah, I have definitely. I just need to. I want to keep with the theme of not uh, of keeping. You know, not adding any fees. So if I can figure out a way to do that with Visa or Mastercard, definitely do that as well. Well, I mean, if you buy, like, if somebody buys a fifty dollar prepaid Visa card with fifty dollars worth. Then um, would they end up with the fifty dollars value, or how does I don't even know how? That's those... what I'm saying. I need to figure out a way that I can make money, but the users don't pay any extra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. The affiliate link—that's probably a key for the affiliate, because you're probably not going to get an affiliate link for those. With Visa or Mastercard, probably not. But yeah, I I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. I'm sure. I mean, everybody's trying to come up with better, better ways to do it, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's sort of competition, but it's in a friendly competition where everybody wants Bitcoin to succeed, and it's just uh, kind of like a fun little competition to see who can come up with the most innovative way. It's, it's kind of like open source, like open source yeah. projects competing, but everybody wants everything to win, you know, and we just like feed off of each other's ideas and let me see if I can uh, up, up my game and make, I, you know, that's a fantastic idea. Let me see if I can do it even better. Oh, I've got another idea, you know, adding to it, making it better, making it more efficient, making it easier. I love it. So, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said thank you. Sure, sure. So the, um, you have a newborn baby, so how does that affect your, uh, your time to uh, work on all of this? Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, uh, basically, I, I put up this original URL to spendbitcoins.com probably um, six or seven weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there were any orders for the first three weeks or so, and I just happened to post in the bitcoin.org forums mm -hmm. and immediately just took off Boom. from yeah. that day. Yeah. And um, it's really sort of been a full-time job, and my um, my daughter was born two weeks ago yesterday, and congratulations! Uh, I, I had yeah, thank you. I had said, oh, this is I, my first thought with the business taking off was this is fantastic because it'll allow me to spend more time at home um, than I was going to from taking time off my job, mm -hmm. but then. It, I realized that even though I'm at home, I'm working full time. When I was going to take a couple of weeks off and not be working at all, so yeah, it is. It is a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you never but know. This could take off and, and become your job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's fantastic. So, as as far as um, other websites and services, what what do you consider like the the most interesting, intriguing uh, concepts that you've seen so far? Um, the Bitcoin show. Which one? <laughs> the Bitcoin show. Oh, the Bitcoin. Oh, this show. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, that's pretty cool. Uh, what else? <laughs> other, other interesting concepts. Obviously, um, you just interviewed Roger Burr, I think, two or three episodes ago. Yeah. That billboard was uh, was huge. Right. And not only that, he's. Um, he, I don't, he didn't mention. I don't think that he's spending. A lot of his own money advertising on a national radio program called Free Talk Live. I think he, he did mention that, but he didn't mention that it's the ad itself isn't actually um, linking to anything of his. It's it, it's just explaining what bitcoins are. So he's not making any money off the ad, other than making Bitcoin value go up. Since you mean? A lot of Bitcoin. It, are you talking about? I mean, the billboard advertises his business, but you're talking about the radio ads. He, he's yeah, not the radio ad. Just says. 
basically, it's like a uh, public service announcement about Bitcoins. No, what I did not are. know that. I mean, I knew that. I read in the forum that you know that um, he had he was spending th I don't know thousands, like five thousand a month or something like that on on radio ads, but I assumed it was for MemoryDealers.com. But you're saying it was just a, like a PSA almost type of an ad, like a general information ad that he's paying for promoting Bitcoin. Yeah, and it's still going. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, anybody who questions his integrity when it comes to his enthusiasm and evangelizing Bitcoin there is way off the mark because that's, a, that's really amazing. I didn't know that. That's uh, yeah, even, I mean, I, even more um, credit to him. That's amazing. And the billboard was, was just an ingenious he, idea. Sorry? I don't think he was kidding when he said that, he, um, that he's been up all day and all night obsessing about Bitcoin since, <laughs> since he found out about him. Right. Yeah, I don't. Bl I I I believe him absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a really very very. Uh, I mean, you know, he he's like it's funny because you know he spends a lot more on the radio ads apparently, obviously, than the billboard. But that uh, billboard really was probably the best investment he ever paid in <laughs> in marketing. It's just we accept Bitcoin with a gigantic bitcoin image and saying p2p you know we accept bitcoin p2p cryptocurrency it's just especially out there in silicon valley that must be like it must have been all the buzz but it was all over twitter and facebook and everybody's talking about it that had more yeah. reach than a national radio ad yeah you know one yeah, of the well, things I was thinking, so you're asking what applications to bitcoin or whatever i guess um to me what the whole thing that got me into Bitcoin in the first place is i'm american but i live in australia I have uh, a lot of college debt in America, so I have to transfer money over there every month. And um, I just got tired of PayPal when they shut down Julian Assange's account and um, it was constantly charging me fees, uh, getting me fees charged by my bank because it was um, not very user friendly and basically I was using the wrong account or something. And anyway, so. I just posted on Facebook and asked if anybody knew an alternative to, to PayPal mm -hmm. and someone said, well, what about Bitcoins? And I hadn't heard of them yet and um, that was the killer app for me. It's just moving money from one country to another without any foreign transaction so, fees or anything. So you're using it. That's interesting because that's a, obviously a huge thing. I mean, Western Union is, exists on that. People sending money home, um, you know, whether you're an immigrant uh, or whatever. In your case, you're just a, you're an expat, <laughs> expatriate. Yeah. So when you send money back and forth, um, how do you how do you you do that? I mean, what's the you you take your currency and buy it on an exchange or? Um, well, yeah, it, it's, I do it by uh, starting up spendbitcoins.com basically because um, the Austra there's not really an Australian exchange. There's there's one that's just started up called BitPiggy. Uh, I don't know the, the address, but it only allows up to $500 trade and whatever. But the idea would, would have been um, that I would buy Bitcoins with Australian dollars mm -hmm. on an Australian exchange, mm -hmm. transfer them to an American exchange, and sell them in American dollars. Okay. So we need more exchange. Is Trade Hill doing Australian dollars yet? No. Um, no, I, I've no. thought about being there. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think they, I read they're looking for partners who uh, can help in, in local countries all over the world to uh, help assist them in uh, handling local currencies. So there's a good idea. Yeah, I actually, I actually applied for that and then haven't done anything with it because I'm too busy to spend Bitcoins.com. <laughs> right. I want an Australian exchange to exist, um, and if I have to start it, I'll start it, but I kind of hope somebody else starts it up. <laughs> It's one of those, you know, you're like me. It's like I want, I want so many things to exist, and I used to just start things and start so many things. And of course, you know, you could. That's actually part of the meaning of uh, Only One TV. When I thought of the name, was um, about me that I need focus. I need to focus on only one thing because <laughs> I've got three thousand projects going at all times. So it's like, okay, I got to have a focus here. And so, what is your day job? What is it? What is it? The the job that you're uh, taking? Uh, market. Um three different things, timeshare, um, real estate, investment, properties, and um, what's the other thing that I market? Oh, um, stock exchange um, software. Wow. So marketing all these things. Do you, and do you accept Bitcoin in that business? 
<laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> I, I, I'm just a peon in that business. I don't have a lot to. <laughs> mm, okay, it's timeshares. Okay, you should. That's what you know. How they give you a free brunch if you listen to the timeshare spiel. You should give them a free Bitcoin if they Bitcoin listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a marketing idea. What's a Bitcoin? Yeah. Starts a whole conversation. Just see if you're a real evangelist, like you, uh, Roger Vera. <laughs> So, um, yeah. all right. So, what else? You, you're gonna you're gonna set up the first uh, exchange in Australia for Australian no, no, dollar. No no, no, no. Oh, I thought that was what you said. Okay. <laughs> you're hoping someone does it. Okay. Now, and then when the when the dollars come back or the bitcoins back come back to the states, then how does your family or, or associates here how do they convert it to dollars? No, no. All, all I would do would be um, uh, sell it on Trade Hill and then. And then transfer it through Dwala just to my own bank account in the U.S. Oh, okay. So you're just doing it all online. That's great. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you just you can just uh, buy Bitcoin, whatever, and then sell or just end up buy receiving Bitcoin. Currency, sell it in another currency. That's all. Oh, that's what you're doing. All right, all right. So you're receiving the Bitcoin, obviously, from spendbitcoin.com, and then you, the Bitcoin, and then you're trading. I mean, you're selling them for U.S. dollars on Trade Hill, and then using Trade Hill to transfer them to Dwala into your U.S. bank account. And then when yeah. you need money, you can go to an ATM and take uh, Australian dollars out of your U.S. bank account, right? I could do that, but they'd charge exorbitant fees, so no. I'd probably okay. go the other way around. And, <laughs> and, uh, okay, I used to do that. I lived in Taipei, Taiwan, which is over there, like neighbors. For you. I lived there for a couple of years, and um, I would get paid, and it was so weird because I... I I didn't I either wasn't allowed to have a bank account over there or I couldn't figure out how to open one you know it's all Chinese anyway I remember that they paid you they actually weirdly in Taiwan and in Asia um, it's their custom that they don't pay a check they give you cash and they only pay once a month so I had a salary position and once a month they would call you and you'd go down to the payroll department and they would give you an envelope full of cash. It was the weirdest thing I ever saw. Everybody walks out that day with a big old envelope full of cash, and that made me very uncomfortable because Taipei is a big city, you know. So I would walk straight across the street and I would buy a money order, and then I would just put it in the mail and mail it back to my bank in Ohio, and uh, just put the whole thing into the bank. And then I would just use the ATM to take out, um, you know, the Thai, uh, Thai, the Thailand, Thai. Why am I saying Thailand? The Taiwanese. <laughs> Um, I can't even remember what the currency is called. Anyway, the local currency. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is a bitcoins are huge for expats, I think, because like I know in China, I mm -hmm. know people who moved back from, from China, and um, they only allow you to take out. I don't know. There's a very limited amount of money that you can take out of the country, basically. Out so of if you just buy coins instead. And, yeah. Um, sell them when you get back to your own country. Then there you go. Right. So um, there. So how do how do you? I mean, how do you? If you're using it to bypass the limits of the currency, taking out of the, so basically, but it's it's not currency. It's uh, legally not currency. It's just a virtual commodity, right? Yeah. So in effect, you're buying a virtual commodity and selling gift cards on Amazon. Right. <laughs> okay. So. Um, that's cool. How, do you have a lot of, I mean, do your friends and associates in Australia there, do they, are they aware of Bitcoin? Are they or only through you? Or how do they, what's their reaction to that? Um, yeah, only through me. <laughs> um, I, I do a podcast that's been, uh, and it's been off the air for uh, several months because my wife is my co-host and she was pregnant and um, just, yeah, whatever. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's freeozradio.com, mm. which uh, now I have to give you a URL working again since I just said it. But anyway, <laughs> the, a lot of, uh, <laughs> there's interest in Bitcoins amongst the listeners of Free Oz Radio. So mm -hmm. um, those are the strategies that I know of that, that are into it. I don't know personally other than that I've mentioned Bitcoins to people does who the, work or whatever. Does the Australian government have any position or... Um, you know, made any statements or anything like that? Is there anybody, been any press in Australia, a pro or con? Bitcoin? Well, there was, there was press there when the senator, when Senator Schumer, made the big deal about um, mm. uh, the Silk Road. Right. And basically, 
the Australian government position was, you know, we're not into drugs, but we have no jurisdiction over Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. that was good. That's good. At least they have some common sense. It seems like they have a lot more common sense than some of these wackos here. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll Schumer. see. We'll see yeah, over time. If, you know, like if the U.S. did do something, then I'm sure Australia would follow. Governments like to follow each other once they crack mm. down on something or whatever. Yeah, sometimes they do, and I think sometimes they're coerced into it too, just uh, yeah, yeah. by peer pressure. The bully on the playground says it's bad, so it's bad. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that's interesting, but yeah, like I, you know, whatever. I don't know anyone who's using uh, Bitcoin for things like that. No, at I, least. It's funny that I don't know if you read the articles, but uh, Chuck Schumer said that it was uh, it was flooding the streets with drugs. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Flooding. A, a single Bitcoin person that was using it, or you no, know, I know a Bitcoin. Being. Exactly. I don't know a single Bitcoin person that. I mean, I can't. You know, I can't obviously read people's minds. I'm not a psychic uh, like Schumer, but uh, I, I have no <laughs> idea, you know, if, if somebody actually did buy some weed on Silk Road or something. But I, nobody I know, people tell me things, by the way. People tell me all kinds of things. Um, and I keep their confidence, you know, they're, they're telling me all sorts of secrets um, or whatever, you know, for whatever reason, they're about to launch a product or a service or something coming up or they're working on something. They tell me things in, in confidence and I keep their confidence. But not one person has told me that they have used Bitcoin to buy anything illegal, um, including drugs. So it's just absurd. It's where, you know, um, that the streets are being flooded by drugs is just obvious hysteria. I mean, what it... I want to know what drugs that guy's on. Yeah. You know, where is he getting his information? Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm not an illicit drug user, and but don't get me wrong. I think it's actually a good thing that people can go um, somewhere. People that are going to use drugs can actually go somewhere where they can get feedback and see that you know the sellers are doing what they've actually said they're doing and all that sort of thing, as opposed to buying them on a street corner. I think well, that's, that's a better way. Of that's an interesting uh, thought. I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that. But yeah, that's yeah, right. I did read eBay, that so they review the sellers, don't they? Just like eBay. Sellers and buyers and everything. So, whereas in the regular black market, um, you're just at the whim of whatever you know. Whatever happens, happens because it's not like you can take them to court. It's not like you can get inform you can get information. I suppose if a friend is bought through them or whatever. But um, here, you know, it's, it's so actually peer review. It's well, and obviously, for buying drugs if you're going to buy them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these, obviously, so, a lot of, you I know, mean, many of those things are completely legal in certain places, like in the in Amsterdam and the Netherlands and things. It's it'd be interesting to see if they if they uh, spawn a whole new breed of uh, Silk Roads uh, based in the Netherlands, where it, these things I mean, are you don't completely need to legal. Go into the coffee shop and buy it. So why would you yeah. need to do the? I wonder if they are. We have to ask people in the Netherlands. Let us know. Are there any uh, any of those coffee shops in the, in Amsterdam that are uh, accepting Bitcoin? Uh, write to me. That would be an interesting story. But yeah, that's an interesting take on it. That at least you know there's there's peer view, review and community review. And if you are going to use illicit drugs and buy them anyway, then you know maybe that is actually a good thing for those people to at least they know what they're getting and starting up. Yeah, uh, it's not flooding the streets with drugs. I don't think there's a lot of people that are starting using drugs just because the Silk Road is in existence. Yeah, I don't. I yeah, uh, I haven't seen the streets being flooded uh, anywhere around me, and I have, like I said, I have yet to hear the first person actually tell me that they've actually bought something illegal with Bitcoin. So, um, I'm still waiting for somebody to tell me that they actually did that. Um, I'll let you know as soon as I do hear of that. Well, anyway, thanks, Jeremy, for joining us. I know it's it's late over there in Australia. The sun must be going down or coming up by no, now. No, it's really lunchtime. Oh, it's lunchtime. Okay. Well, it's late here. But uh, thanks for joining us. It was really, really fun. And uh, let's do it again. All the best with um, spendbitcoins.com. I, I can see it expanding into a, a, its own Amazon.com. It'll be the Amazon.com of the future and put your uh, little baby through college. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bruce. Sure. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. We'll see you on Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, The Bitcoin Show, and um, every weekday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and on Wednesdays, 4 p.m. in Spanish, 
Let all your friends who speak Spanish know El Show de Bitcoin. See you. See you Monday.